Stewardship is a path with many steps. The steps landowners take are linked to their goals, their values, and their vision for their land. In Standish, Maine, in the Presumpscot River watershed, the Portland Water District owns and manages forest land around Sebago Lake with one major goal in mind, clean drinking water. Sebago Lake is such excellent water quality in large part due to its mostly forested watershed. The watershed is 81.5% forested, we determined back in 2001 by looking at aerial photographs. Lakes that have mostly forested watersheds typically have excellent water quality. The forest purifies water, prevents erosion, and helps store water also. In the forest you have a canopy which intercepts the raindrops. You have the duff layer on the forest floor made up of leaves and decaying organic matter that acts like a sponge to absorb water and protects the soil from erosion. And you also have the uneven floor of the forest with dips and depressions in it with help, which helps to slow down water and um, capture it and store it. Whereas in a developed watershed, we pave over, uh, smooth out the landscape, build houses and shopping complexes and parking lots and driveways and create these hard flat surfaces which cause runoff to speed up, move much more quickly and pick up pollutants along the way and cause a lot of erosion. In Connecticut there was a study that was done to try to figure out uh, how much forest does a lake watershed need in order to for the lake to have pure water quality and they determined that once the watershed gets down to 75 to 80 percent forested that's when they could detect changes in the water chemistry. The Sebago Lake watershed is currently at 81.5 percent forested, so we're getting near that threshold of where we could see changes in water quality due to uh, loss of forest in the watershed. We have a land acquisition policy that allows us to um, purchase land from willing sellers around the lower bay of Sebago Lake. Any properties that are within 500 feet of the lake and also within two miles of our intake, we buy from willing sellers and then if there's a house or a structure on the property, we tear it down uh, and replant trees and allow it to grow back into natural forest land. The Sebago Lake watershed is 300,000 acres. We own only 1% of the watershed. A lot of water suppliers own all of their watershed, but the greatest part of Sebago Lake watershed is privately owned. We also have a land preservation policy. We support landowners. We will give them some money towards the out-of-pocket expenses that are needed to put a conservation easement on their land. So at the Portland Water District, we treat the land that's closest to the lake as if it was zoned for resource protection which means it has a higher level of protection. We harvest fewer trees out of that zone, which is 75 feet from the lake. Our forester, Rennie, was overseeing harvesting in an area back from the lake. I marked the stem up high so that the logger can see the paint, and I also marked the stump so I can come back and check the stumps to make sure that the logger cut the trees that were marked. I don't know if that shows that opening, that old opening there or not, but what I'm doing is I'm coming along on the south side of this opening and to release that regeneration is hemlock and oak and some beech in there, uh, seedlings and saplings, and uh, I'm going to expand the opening and give them a little bit more room to grow. I encourage all of my clients to, to mark their boundary lines with blazing and painting trees. You can see that hemlock has got at least three ages of blazes on it. It's been a line tree for a long time. Our company did the uh, boundary maintenance the last time, and I can tell you that blaze uh, was put in at that time and is probably about 15 years old. The word sustainability is, has become in vogue, but foresters have always used it. Sustainable management, sustainable harvesting. Uh, we don't want to cut more trees than we grow, and so we come back every 10, 15, 20 years and thin the same forest stands. And trees are convenient, they keep growing back, we haven't run out.
We've been cutting trees here for 400 years and we still have plenty of trees. The water's actually going down on these little leaves and coming back out there. So if, I, if, we, if we got it across it, we'd just squish right down into it. It's an old crossing. They probably used the dozers back in the 50s, but it probably wouldn't hold us up. We just make a mess, rotten it up. We just throw the bridge in real quick and, and keep it on rolling. One excellent tool for protecting water during an active harvest operation is a temporary portable skitter bridge. Three pieces. It's too wider outside and the middle one's actually a little easier to handle because it's a little narrower, but it, uh, the three pieces, you can pick them right up. You can pick them up with a center hook in the middle of an excavator if you want to, or you can, we just set them with a grapple skitter. That's just what we have here and it's easier. The Maine Forest Service can help logging contractors and woodland owners purchase or borrow wooden or steel bridges, which can be taken from site to site as needed. Skitter bridges are used effectively in a variety of weather and soil conditions during most seasons of the year. See, we crossed here uh, 10 or 12 years ago, and if I wasn't here to say that there had been a skitter crossing here, I think most people would have a hard time telling a skitter had ever gone across that brook. The water district prefers to have softwood on its lands rather than hardwood because hardwood leaves cause them a problem in their water intake and treatment process. So I, I try to encourage softwood here as much as I can. The Maine Forest Service assigns a tracking number to timber harvests across the state. At the end of each year, woodland owners report on the forest products harvested on their property. This is planned to be an integrated harvest operation. All products will be produced. A saw logs will be produced from the pine, hemlock, oak, uh, hardwood firewood from the smaller hardwood stems that are cut, pulpwood from the tops, and and trees that aren't suitable for saw logs, and firewood, and chips from trees that aren't suitable for pulpwood. Oh, my solder chainsaw. I just started on the same skitter my father did, my grandfather's old 1968 440A, that's what I started on. I didn't start cutting by mechanical till 95. I started logging actually in 92. Yeah, it's definitely safer, because I mean, it's amazing how many things you know, crafts down on you definitely more expensive. We went, when we started, when I started, we probably burn six, seven gallons a day. And right now, the way the operation is now, we burn 300 gallons a day just in the woods. So, we used to move average two of us with a cable skid up to be average two load a day every week. And now I can cut up to 10. To, I, that most I've done is 15 load a day. You have to leave limbs out to rot because that's what generates, that's what makes dirt healthy four trees that grow is limbs to rotten and rotten away and a lot of it does break off and so it does get that it's, it's less of it because we chip it and we got lugging it all out versus conventionally and limit it out here but 99 percent of our work today is done chip been leaving that Red oak there, it's about three feet in diameter. Its center is rotten. It's got some dead branches in the top that are rotten. And, uh, it's a pretty nice wildlife tree. See places on it where woodpeckers have been working up in the crown. And uh, you know, it's, it's a good sturdy tree. It's gonna be there a long time, provide cover for, for some species of wildlife. The land that the 
Water District owns around the lower bay of the lake, and we call the Sebago Lake Land Reserve. And most of that is open to the public. We have a lot of trails. Uh, people like to come and uh, snowmobile on them in the winter or cross-country ski or snowshoe. And we do allow hunting also in, in the fall, and uh, people love to use the trails for walking or hiking on. There's a Sebago to the Sea trail that is nearing completion. It's a trail that will allow people to walk uh, from the ocean in, in Portland all the way to Sebago Lake out here. We're in what I call mixed growth habitat. It's great habitat for deer. And the nice thing about this land reserve is we've got 3,000 acres, which is within 15 miles of Portland. It's very quiet. It's solitude. You don't have to uh, think of the hustle and bustle of the world. You can just wander around out here and enjoy the peace and quiet. I come here sometimes three times a week. I, I primarily hike, sometimes I snowshoe. Oh, I, I like the, the nature, the solitude. This is Noble, he's a standard bred. He used to be a racehorse with a sulky behind him. So he's had a lot of retraining and now he loves to go out on trails. We're very fortunate to have trails such as the Otter Ponds and the Mountain Division Trail. We have three people in our education department and they have a classroom based program and work with fifth and sixth graders and teach them different things about water and fish and they even raise trout from eggs in their classrooms and tanks and then release them into the rivers. There it goes. Can you see it? <laughs> so it looks about Maybe 6.5. During Drinking Water Week in May, we offer a number of talks and, and walks here at the Sebago Lake Ecology Center. Kids and people come and get to check out a nearby vernal pool and take a look at some of the um, frog and salamander eggs that are in there. Oh, I saw it! Good! We monitor the water in the 10 major tributaries around the lake um, once a month, 12 months out of the year. We monitor the Crooked River all the way up to Bethel where it comes out of Songo Pond. The Crooked River supplies 40% of all the surface water that comes into Sebago Lake, so that's the most important tributary. And we also monitor the insects, the macroinvertebrates or aquatic insects, and they tell us something about the health of the river, the water quality. If we find insects that can only tolerate good water quality, then we know that the river's doing well. So we picked these mesh bags full of rocks out of the river, and now we are kind of washing off the rocks and collecting the insects in the bucket. This is a caddis fly. Here is a stone fly, which is an in indicator of good water quality. It was good to see the number of stone flies that we saw. lot of different reasons why someone may want to plant trees, whether it's for aesthetics, timber production, wildlife habitat, or in the case of the Portland Water District where we are, where those other factors are important, but the primary concern is right out there. That's the drinking water for the city of Portland and many other communities here in southern Maine. So the whole reason we're planting these trees is to buffer the lake from runoff, so that's why the Portland Water District has gone the extra mile and put mulch down here to reduce the runoff, and on top of it we're planting trees to contribute to that buffering capacity to help keep the water clean. Before you start, you really want to think about what is the forest you're creating and how are you going to manage it 
20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road. And in this situation, we know that we're gonna have a truck access through here and we're gonna have machinery set up down there. So we've laid this out with rows that will be accessible to the way the machinery is gonna access it. The Portland Water District also does timber harvesting on a regular basis to maintain the vigor and health and growth of the forest because a healthy forest is growing better. It's gonna have better nutrient uptake and protect water. Probably the most important thing for forest owners to know is when they're doing any harvesting to make sure that they leave an undisturbed buffer of trees between the harvesting and any water bodies. That will allow for water to infiltrate and be purified before it reaches lake or stream. There's a handbook that the Maine Forest Service puts out called Best Management Practices for Forestry. is a great guide for making sure that your logging operations protect any water bodies that you have. Mm -hmm.